reflection and refraction can be used to make images of objects for a variety of purposes. The simplest tool for creating an image by reflection is a flat mirror. You probably looked at an image of yourself in a mirror this morning. Consider a flat mirror with a small object in front of it as illustrated. Light from the object leaves in all directions and reflects off of the mirror according to the law of reflection. The angle in equals the angle out. Notice that if we continue the outgoing rays back behind the mirror, they appear to originate at an identical object behind the mirror. This is what we mean by an image when light originating from one point is bent or reflected by an optical device so that its origin appears to be another point. In this case, the image is called a virtual image because the light never actually reached the image. No light ever reaches behind the mirror. This does not mean that we cannot see the image, however. When we look in a mirror, our eyes see only the outgoing rays, and we interpret them as pictures of ourselves positioned behind the mirror. Notice that, for a flat mirror, the distance between the image and the mirror, known as the image distance, S sub i, is the same as the distance between the object being reflected and the mirror, known as the object distance, S sub o. The situation gets both more complicated and more interesting when the mirror is curved. The image may show a different size, position, or orientation than the object being reflected. What's more, when curved mirrors are involved, using the law of reflection directly to trace the rays becomes very difficult. We need another method to achieve this. Consider the mirror illustrated. Because the light hits it on the side that curves inward, it is called a concave mirror. You can remember this by imagining that the mirror forms a small cave. If this mirror is parabolic, all light rays going in that are parallel to the axis of the mirror are focused at a point called the focal point. The distance between the focal point and the mirror is called the focal length and is denoted by lowercase f. Because the light converges, concave mirrors are also called converging mirrors. Conversely, light that approaches the mirror through the focal point is reflected parallel to the axis of the mirror. In practice, parabolic mirrors are hard to make, so we use spherical mirrors instead. As long as we use only a small portion of the sphere, the mirror is very nearly parabolic, and the focal length is simply half the mirror's radius of curvature. Now we'll begin to trace rays to find the position of images formed by the mirror. In reality, light leaves the object in all directions and reflects off all parts of the mirror. However, we will trace just a few special rays that are easy to show and use them to find the location of the image it is convenient to use an arrow as our object. The image will be an arrow with the tip where the rays cross and the base on the axis of the mirror. First we consider a single ray of light that leaves the object parallel to the axis of the mirror. Because this ray that approaches the mirror is parallel to the mirror's axis, when it is reflected it must pass through the focal point. Next we consider the ray that leaves the object and passes through the focal point of the mirror. When it reflects off the mirror, it must be parallel to the axis. Generally, these two rays we have considered are sufficient to determine the location of the image. But there are two other rays that we can use to check our answer. First, the ray that touches the center of the mirror effectively hits a flat vertical mirror, so the angle out equals the angle in. Second, any line passing through the center of curvature will be perpendicular to the mirror and thus will reflect directly back. This ray, while simple and helpful, is often the least accurate of the principal rays. Let's review what we've covered here. There are four principal rays. The first ray is parallel to the axis as it approaches the mirror and is reflected back through the focus. The second passes through the focus as it approaches the mirror and is reflected back parallel to the axis. The third ray strikes the middle of the mirror and is reflected back in an angle in equals angle out manner. The fourth passes through the center of curvature 
and is reflected directly back out, following its ingoing path. Now consider the image. In this case, all the rays really do cross, and if we put a screen at the point of crossing, we could focus the image there. This is a real image because the rays really cross. Notice that the image is upside down or inverted. This is a general property of real images formed by a single optical element. The image is also closer to the mirror than the object being reflected is, and it is smaller than the object. Thus, such an image is described as real, inverted, and smaller. Accordingly, we describe an image from a flat mirror as virtual, upright, and the same size. Suppose we have a mirror shaped like the outside of our last mirror, reflecting light off the outside surface. Such a mirror is known as a convex mirror. Parallel light that approaches the mirror cannot converge to the mirror's focus, because the focus is on the far side of the mirror. Instead, the light reflects as if it has come from the focus, and diverges outward. Notice that if we extend the outgoing rays backward through the mirror, they do meet at the focus. Because the rays reflected from this sort of mirror diverge, a convex mirror is also called a diverging mirror. As you might expect from our earlier discussion, rays moving towards the mirror that are heading towards the focal point are parallel to the mirror's axis when they are reflected back by the mirror. Here again, though these rays are directed towards the focus as they approach the mirror, they are reflected before actually reaching the focus. Our principal rays are now, first, parallel going in and out as if they come from the focus and through the point of reflection, second, in towards the focus and out from the point of reflection parallel to the mirror's axis, third, into the middle of the mirror, reflected back such that angle in equals angle out. Both angles are measured relative to the axis of the mirror. Fourth, towards the center of curvature and straight back out, following the ingoing path backwards. Notice that the outgoing rays do not cross. However, if we extend the lines back behind the mirror from their points of reflection, they do cross. Thus, this is a virtual image, because the rays leave as if they had crossed at a point, even though none of them actually reached that point. The image created is virtual, upright, and smaller than the object. In general, images from a concave or diverging mirror will be virtual, upright, and smaller than the original object. So far, we have used ray tracing to find and classify images formed by spherical mirrors. However, much can be gained from a mathematical approach to this subject, especially when used in conjunction with the drawings. Ray tracing helps develop physical intuition while math helps quantify the phenomena. The first equation simply states that the focal length is half the radius of curvature as we previously mentioned. The second equation is known as the lens equation, though it works equally well for mirrors. S sub O is the object distance, the distance from the object to the mirror. S sub I is the image distance, the distance from the image to the mirror, and F is the focal length the distance from the focal point to the mirror. Each of these distances is positive in cases when the light actually reaches the described point, object, image, or focus, and negative when reflected rays merely behave as though they had. Thus a virtual image has a negative image distance because the light rays don't extend to the image. A convex diverging mirror has a negative focal length because the light rays never actually focus at the focal point. The object distance is almost always positive, because the light actually originates at the object. Be careful when using this equation. You cannot simply invert each term and get S sub I plus S sub O equals F. It is not. Let's work an example. Suppose an object is placed 10 centimeters in front of a mirror with a radius of curvature of 8 centimeters. Where is the image? First, we find the focal length to be 4 centimeters. Next, we solve the equation for the image distance and plug in the values and find that the image is 6.7 centimeters from the mirror. Because the distance is positive, 
the image is real. Now consider the third equation. The first part simply defines the magnification m as the ratio of the image height h sub i to the object height h sub o. The sign of m indicates whether the image is upright or inverted. m is positive for an upright image and negative for an inverted image. The magnitude of m indicates the relative size of the image compared to that of the object. If the image is larger than the object, the absolute value of m is greater than 1. If the image is smaller than the object, the absolute value of m is less than 1. The second part of the equation relates the image magnification to the image distance and the object distance. Notice that if both the image and the object are real, the magnification will be negative and the image will be inverted. Returning to our example, suppose the object is 3 centimeters high. How tall is the image? By rearranging the equations, we find that the magnification is negative 0.67 and that the image is 2 centimeters and inverted. These equations can be used together to solve a wide variety of problems. It is often useful to determine quickly where an image will be positioned and what its relative size and orientation will be. Try using ray tracing and the equations to verify this chart. The next section will discuss how the ideas discussed here apply to lenses.